Hi, my name is Eric. I just finished building a post frame house or the outside of one over the last year. I wanted to put together a video uh, for anyone else who's considering building a building like this to go over the top 10 things I've learned or rather the top 10 categories of things I've learned building it. Uh, it's a 40 by 40 house, single level, square shape, doing a lot of things to try to make it as energy efficient as possible. Uh, let me show you more of the layout. Right now we're looking at it from the south, uh, southeast. You can see it has a lot of south facing windows. Uh, both the doors and the bedroom casement windows are symmetrical. That's to create some cross ventilation. It is a fairly tall building for the nine foot finished ceiling height. That's to accommodate a lot of blown in insulation. Uh, if you look, there's little squares under the building. That is the piers for the posts. Those are covered with foam, which is then covered with a synthetic stucco. So looking from southwest, you can see pretty symmetrical. Only real difference here is there is an opening for a future kitchen exhaust vent in place of one of the windows. All right, here I'm standing on my driveway looking south, southeast. So you can see there are no windows on the north side. That's done on purpose. Uh, they don't get any solar gain and they just lose a lot of heat. Additionally, the road kicks up a lot of gravel dust. So I'm glad they're not there for that reason. The one opening on the north will be for the air exchanger. It'll have a coaxial style vent, so it only needs uh, one hole. And that's what that little white cover is gonna be for. Now we're in the house, looking out one of those big south facing windows. This area here is gonna be one big open room, like a multi-use room. Just trying to look west, you can see still in that one big room, I'll kind of overlay a view of what it'll look like when it's done. And then here, let's see if my camera will start to adjust a little. That's where the kitchen's gonna be against that back wall. Uh, there'll be a bedroom back there. On the far back area, there'll be a utility room. And then another bedroom symmetrical to the first one. And then along the wall, more open area. And going back to where we started, you can see good views from this main area here. You can really see pretty far. So I've got everything exposed for some of the upcoming electrical work, but you can really see the structure of the piers. So I actually made insulated forms. So I had a 2 inch XPS on the inside of the form and then made these little steps at the top where the sturdy wall brackets go in. I did that because uh, usually with the Hansen plans, they would have you pour a concrete slab on top later. But I'm planning a plywood slab, so I won't have a concrete slab. So I did this all as a single monolithic pour. I think it was 4K mix with uh, fibrillated fibers, 4K outdoor mix. Um, didn't have time to finish the tops like I wanted, but I was able to go back and put some topping cement on the tops for the outside, and that looked pretty good. Um, so these are drilled uh, five foot below the insulated forms into the ground at least. And then the insulated forms are two foot tall. So on the outside they still have the two inch XPS. On the inside I took that out. I was just concerned about rodents and stuff. Um, and then the sturdy wall brackets are in there. And then working your way up you can see here's the post. It's a laminated post of treated lumber. There's girt blocks holding the girts in that are nailed to the walls. And then the trusses sit directly on the posts and notches and they are bolted in with a single bolt. I believe the reason that was engineered that way uh, was to ensure that the trusses don't take too much of the wall bending loads. And then if you go up more, you can see there's double trusses that are screwed together and joists and joist hangers, purlins and joist hangers as well. And that's pretty much it, that's the structure. Uh, jumping into the top 10 things I've learned, I'd say number 10 is it's a lot easier to own equipment than rent equipment. With that in mind, I bought this Bobcat at auction at the beginning of last year. Been pretty happy with it so far. I mainly use it with the forks I've uh, moved the bundles of wood around, uh, racks of the metal panels, windows, 
used it with the uh, extending boom to help set the outer trusses. Very invaluable having it so you don't have to move stuff around yourself. Uh, let's see, buying at auction, I recommend doing that uh, if at all possible and if you feel comfortable inspecting this kind of equipment to ensure it's in overall good shape. There are auctions out there where they do guarantee there are no major problems with the equipment. Uh, I recommend that kind of approach. Uh, and then truck-wise, got an older free quarter ton. It served me well. Ninth on the list would be to get a Connex container or a shipping container. Uh, depending on the size of your building, the 40 foot, which I have, may be the best choice. Stored all so sorts of stuff in there. Windows, the metal panels, the posts, a bunch of lumber. Um, all sorts of stuff. Right now you can see I've got insulation in there. It's just invaluable to have a place to store things. Even if you have a building on site already, it may not be the right size or you may not have room. And these are inexpensive and weather tight. So I definitely recommend getting one of these. You'll be able to tuck everything in there and not worry about it if there's a storm or something. You can leave the metal panels outside for a while, but what happens is the water will start to wick in between the panels, especially if they have the drip stop coating on them and over time that will deteriorate your paint. So you don't want that. So that's why I recommend getting one of these and using it to store as much as possible. Uh, I made wooden racks uh, for the metal panels with rollers on the bottom that you can use the forks on the skid steer to pull around. Uh, it's been super nice doing it that way. All right, a thing I learned uh, is layout, or rather the building layout. And so when you're planning the building, I'd say the most important thing to keep in mind to make the layout as easy as possible is the unchangeable 9 inch spacing, center line spacing of the egg panel ribs. So you can't change it, so it would be in your advantage to um, every time there's something you can change, like the width of a custom window um, or the overall size of your building, make that a dimension that's divisible by 9. Um, so what that does is it gives you the option to center your windows on the, the gaps between the ribs, um, and with the building dimension for your end trims, your corner trims, or your rake trims, to tuck the ribs in there perfectly. Um, See, so I didn't do it, but it would be nice. It'd make it easier to get all those details right, make it a little less fussy. Continuing on the layout stuff, um, more layout work for once you get into the building. Um, just some things to keep in mind. Think about the location of your wet set brackets if you're using those. The width of the bracket is actually a little less than the width of the column. Uh, what that does is gives you the freedom to set your brackets in from your layout by about half of that difference. I should have done that, I didn't, so I had to notch my grade board slightly to hit everything to layout. So obviously I use string lines here to figure this all out. I use string lines whenever possible, and I also recommend getting a rotary laser and using that whenever possible. So um, another place I use the laser is up here um, on the top of the post where the trusses sit uh, on the post. I actually lasered that all out to make sure it matched as, as exactly as possible. Same for my wall girts. I lasered the starting location and did everything else off of a metal tape. I did it from the inside of the building because it was raining at the time. It would be even more accurate to do it from the outside of the building um, make your laser marks there because that is where you care about the layout of the bookshelf girts because you're applying the steel to the outside of the building. Um, more on layout uh, with your trusses. I took into account uh, the width of the trusses and I gave an extra allowance for the nail plates. Uh, but the nail plates are a little bit bigger than I thought so all those dimensions were off just a little bit. So I'd say be very careful uh, about how you're calculating the width of your truss and look at it across the thickest nail plates you can find uh, and total those dimensions up. Number seven, running the steel. So before you can even run the steel, you need to have a flat roof deck or a flat wall. And I think what you'll find is lumber is not perfect. What I think would be helpful is to run through your lumber and find the best boards and set aside all the best boards for your fascia boards and then the bevel purlins that sit right behind the fascia purlins. And additionally set some good stuff aside for the rakes. Uh, and then with the rest of it you just need to work around its imperfections. You need to find the ones that don't have bow. And if possible uh, you need to look at them and see what the widths are. The widths can vary across the 2x8 which is what I had. 
Uh, and in some cases, you may need to shim to your joist hanger to get everything lying flat. And then once you get that all set up, you can start checking uh, cross measurements. Make sure those are good with uh, metal tapes is what I liked to do. Do it on both sides of the roof. Um, do the first side, do the second side, and then after you roof the first side, I would recheck the second one because it may shift. Um, and then I also like to run a string line along the eaves that you can sight to from the bottom of the panel. Uh, as far as getting the panels up, I found it easy to just pull them up from a lumber rack I had made. Um, that worked out great. Um, once you get them up there, um, the order I fastened them was I'd do a top screw, a bottom screw, get the edges lined up good, um, and then go run along and push your hand on the laps. Make sure the panel's really seated good with the, the previous panel, and start putting in all the screws along the lap. Get that looking good. And then, um, before roofing, I like to run along and do measurements where each panel is going to end, both on the top and the bottom. So as you get the panel up there, you can check to those measurements and stretch or shrink the panel if you need to, to get it to hit those exactly. Uh, if you do have the anti-condensate coating, which I did, uh, it's helpful to get rid of it completely. I, I know it's recommended to burn it off or melt it off, but I didn't go too extreme with that. I was worried about hurting the paint. Uh, so what I did is I just came back later and pulled it off using a knife to pull against the edge. So you just pulled off a strip. It came off very cleanly that way, so that worked pretty well. When you're running the steel for the walls, I recommend checking um, plumb with a big level for every panel. I liked to mark locations where the panel would end with an expo marker on my house wrap and make sure I was hitting that. I uh, followed the same sequence as with the roof panels, uh, a couple, a top and screw, a bottom screw, uh, when convenient. Sometimes somewhere I'd put the, the screws somewhere else just to hold it in place. Uh, then run along the lap, get the lap held in place, and then run the screws that sit right next to the lap first. Uh, and then make sure that you're stretching or shrinking, usually stretching, to hit your marks that you set up earlier uh, from using that level. And then you can just do the rest of the field screws. Uh, one trick for moving panels is if you've got a cutout for a window or something, is I would slide a two by two into the rib and then just use some hand clamps on either edge of it to support it around the cut. Number six, windows. So a good first step with windows is having a nice generously sized rough opening uh, that's square and plumb. Um, so I used a three eighths inch gap nominal around my window. That worked out pretty good. Um, I think there's good room for a backer rod to come in there later. Uh, there's some additional framing under the window um, and around the lower edges of the window. That's for a sill pan made of zip stretch tape. Um, so what a sill pan is, is like a miniature roof under your window. It makes sure that any water that leaks through the window can get out from the house and it overlaps or shingles onto the house wrap. Um, so definitely fi recommend finding a way to put a sill pan under your window. You can also buy ones that are pre-made from plastic, or I believe you can make them from metal sheets too. Uh, these are triple pane windows, so they are very heavy. The 7x4s are about 300 pounds. I used a uh, cable hoist to lift them into position. I uh, had my wife helping. The process was we would drive them over with the skid steer really slowly on a special rack, get them right into position. Uh, and then get them attached to a special kind of lifting fixture that attached to the to the cable. Uh, so I had like a horizontal 2x8 and then there were two kind of sliding pieces of plywood um, strips, kind of vertical strips to accommodate the different window sizes. And I would screw those into the side nailing flanges of the window. We would lift it all up, it would be balanced on the uh, cable and then we get it right in position hanging kind of like a picture and shim it to where I, we wanted it and then start screwing off just the bottom. I uh, use some pan head screws and then you can go back and pull the lifting apparatus out of there and screw the rest of the screws in. And that process actually worked pretty good. I was very satisfied with the alignment and the positioning of the windows. So I recommend finding a way to use the hoist if you have the heavier type windows. One thing I noticed with the windows is that the laps at the top of the window were opening up a little bit. 
Uh, I was able to fix it by just putting some screws for the tops, the high parts of the ribs uh, in that area and tightening it up. I think it happened because the window flange and the pan head screws I used had enough thickness that they were just kind of distorting uh, that area. The final window detail is I put seals inside of the side J channels. Uh, I would found under some storms, one of my windows would get just a little bit of water dripping down the outside of the house wrap. So probably not an issue. Um, and I believe that was due just to how the side J's underlap. They don't shingle into the roof steel in that area. But to completely fix it, I went and purchased these 3 quarter inch EPDM seals from McMaster. Uh, those fit in there really good and they also look nice. So one of the things I learned about the soffit is that it can rattle, uh, it's steel soffit. Uh, I found it was easy to fix it by just going back with some backer rod and just shoving it in between the soffit and the backing framing material. If I had the chance to do it again I'd put that everywhere, I was only able to put it on the eaves for now, but it did dramatically cut down on the rattling. Number four, sheeting the end truss. Um, so I kind of wish I had sheeted my whole end trusses uh, with plywood. I think CDX plywood would have been the perfect choice for that. Uh, I did go back and put XPS foam in there, which is kind of accomplishing the same general thing. Uh, the thinking would be, is I noticed that the house wrap there is kind of unsupported and it pillows out a lot when the wind gets inside of the channels of the steel. Um, so eventually all the other surfaces of the house will have insulation pushing against the house wrap, but it wouldn't be the case where in the attic the whole thing is supported by insulation pushing on it. So the sheeting it helps prevent that, gives the house wrap a little more durability in that area. Uh, I would just sheet it on the ground before you even lift, lift it up and place it. I think that'd be easiest. Number three, house wrap. Uh, so the house wrap can be challenging to install, particularly when it is windy. Uh, I found it helpful to unwrap, roll it, and put it on a 2x4 and then just clamp the 2x4 to the wall. That way I could just house wrap as I went and not have to leave large sections of the house with just house wraps supported by staples. Uh, I would recommend on the corners uh, just running a continuous 2x4, uh, kind of like an angle made of a 2x4 and a 2x2 or something to make a sharp corner around the outside of your posts. Uh, that will make it a lot easier to pull the house wrap tight in that area and keep it running straight as it goes around the corner. Um, other than that, the house wrap went fairly well. I uh, just don't recommend leaving too much of it unsupported if it's windy and your site is exposed. Number two, piers. Uh, so one thing I did that added greatly to my work is adding a continuous uh, outer layer of in-ground insulation. Um, long term that helps a lot energy efficiency, but it can be a pain to detail it. Um, the outside of the piers is covered with two inches of XPS and then that has a acrylic stucco on top of that. Uh, I found it helpful to slope the top of the piers to make sure water runs off the pier rather than running into the house, uh, which you don't want. Um, so that's what that that is there. There's an additional two inch foam board running down along the walls and then out two foot from both the walls and the piers out here. One challenge I faced with the piers was critter proofing them. Um, so I didn't completely critter proof them uh, and went on to work on other parts of the house and meanwhile the critters came in through the gaps. Um, so I doubled down and ran stainless steel mesh along the inside um, going up you can see it along the walls and then it goes down and there's a second grade board as well that's mounted to the first grade board uh, off of spacers and then the gap between that is filled with foam there's spray foam going between it and the pink XPS foam so I completely air sealed that area up and critter sealed it as a backup with stainless steel mesh I went back on the outside and filled in all the areas where the critters had gone in with the stainless steel mesh. Uh, I brought the tops of the concrete piers up to level with a topping mix and, and then I put more stainless steel mesh around all of the gaps there and stuccoed all that in. So I feel really good about it now. But one rule I would say is make sure there is no path of foam from the outside of your house to the inside of your house uh, that does not have wood steel or concrete blocking it. 
You don't want critters to get in. Uh, you really don't want to hear the scratching sound if they're underneath your concrete pad uh, in the foam there. So I would definitely recommend using a mesh. Uh, you could use the stainless steel mesh. Um, there's other products as well. Stainless is just great because it's going to be there forever. Uh, so that's how I fix that. The piers themselves, when you're pouring them, I definitely recommend vibrating them. Uh, there was one where we didn't vibrate it as much and it did get some honeycombing which I had to go back and fix. Um, so it's one of those ignorance is bliss kind of things. If you have an in-ground pier, you're just not going to see it. But if you take a form off of a pier that wasn't vibrated properly, there's a good chance there'll be honeycombing. Number one, running trims. So some of the trims can be very challenging to run and make good in all, look good in all conditions. Uh, if you think about it, what you're trying to really do is kind of like a magician's trick. You're trying to convince people that drive by that all these separate pieces of trim that are all mounted on a wooden house made of all these imperfect boards is actually perfectly straight. Um, so the best way of accomplishing that is uh, really being fussy about it and trying to accommodate for the expansion and contraction of the metal from the changes in temperature. Uh, steel expands and contracts and if you install the trims when it's cold out, when they expand and it's hot, they're going to look way different. They're going to wrinkle or what's called oil can. Um, and that looks doesn't look good. It breaks the illusion that it's one big piece and you can see that it's all these separate pieces that are flexing and bending. Um, so I went back and redid my fascia trim. That one was very challenging to get looking good. I ordered a fascia trim that has ribs built into it, so it's already starting out stronger. And one thing I noticed about the one with the ribs is that the trim itself is no longer straight. It's meant to be a L trim, and that L actually curves in a little bit from the, the ribs that were put into it. And that is definitely a good thing. So if you leave it in there loose enough, uh, it will stay at that curvy shape and that curvy shape has a lot more strength than a flat shape. Um, so it's able to stay looking good and straight under more conditions. One thing that I would like to have had with the kit was a drip edge. Uh, you don't need a drip edge in my opinion for waterproofing reasons, but it is a very convenient way to hold on and locate the fascia trim while allowing it to expand and contract. Uh, instead what I did is I went back and put battens of PVC on the top and then put just two screws on the bottom. And for every one of these screw holes, I had first pre-drilled them in position and then went back and opened them up so they're dramatically bigger. Uh, I'd say maybe a 3 eighths inch diameter almost on most of them. And that gives the fascia trim panels room to expand and contract and not bind up and make that oil canning. Um, and I was also able to kind of tension it so there's like the same tension along the whole fascia trim. As with all of the trims, you want to run them to a string line if at all possible. And also recommend cutting them to as equal of a length as you can. Uh, I didn't do that the first time and I ran up with like a short piece on the end and it didn't look as good. So really put the thought in on the trims. Remember you're like a magician and you want to make the illusion that that's one big solid chunk of building. It's not five pieces of steel. Thanks for watching. If that was helpful, of course, do the thumbs up or comment. If you have additional questions, uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, maybe I'll address them in future videos or maybe I can give you a response. I really love doing this project. I can't wait to do my future shop after I get the house done. Um, so happy building.